Well, everybody, it is 12 o'clock, 12.01. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Caroline Colas. I'm the Senior Director of Health and Wellness at the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan, and we're determined to come together every day, Monday through Friday, from noon to one, in partnership with the Whole Being Institute, to find ways to move through this time together, to virtually connect as a community. And today, we're going to be talking about stories. We're going to be talking about how stories are the bread of life. And in the darkness, darkest of times and times of upheaval, stories nourish our soul. They heal our suffering and they elevate our capacity to shape and lead our lives and light up inner lights of strength, hope, and wisdom and give us perspective. So we're going to talk today to Maria Serwa, who is an, inter an inspirational and international speaker, consultant, and licensed psychologist. She's worked in the field of resilience and positive psychology for more than 20 years, and she's also an author. And stories and providing hope in different situations are her passion. So I welcome to the call again, Maria, and thank you so much for joining us. Oh, Caroline, it, I love being with you, love what you have created here. This in and of itself, this series is a story. And it's a story that will be told. I mean, just think of this, years from now, we're going to look back and say, remember in COVID-19 when we all came together every single day at noon to cultivate resilience and healing and hope and build community. So you are, we are in the middle, in, in media race, to quote Latin, in the middle of a story as it's being written. And because of that, we wanted to offer you um, some, a, a look into story by sharing some stories, but also then we'll have a conversation about how we gather stories for ourselves that actually inspire hope within us and inspire capacity. In the year 2000, I was participating in a women's conference and the speaker was a woman from the United Nations Commission on Women and Entrepreneurship. And she told the story of a woman she had met in Afghanistan, Mrs. Fauzi, who is a rug maker. She makes beautiful hand-sewn, hand-dyed carpets, large oriental carpets that any one of us might wanna have in our homes. And when Mrs. Fauzi had written to the United Nations Commission on Women and Entrepreneurship, she said she had two concerns, two questions. And when the committee traveled to, the, um, to Kabul and then the outskirts of Kabul to meet Mrs. Fauzi, they learned that one of her questions was that no one in the West buys an Afghani rug. And so she was having trouble actually getting her, her gorgeous rug sold well, they helped her with that. They helped her find a Pakistani dealer who would label the carpets as Pakistani. Her second problem, however, was that every month she lost an employee or had an employee maimed because of the landmine. Well, the women on commission, the Commission on Women and Entrepreneurship had, couldn't solve the landmine problem. There was nothing they could do for her there except bring her story back to the United States, back to the United Nations, back to the host countries for the commission. And yet every day, Mrs. Fauzi continued to show up at work, approach the factory that had been bombed from three stories down to one, knowing that she might hear news that very day of someone who had been killed or maimed. And yet every day she took the key out of her pocket, opened the door and created beauty you see, her sense of meaning and purpose in life is deeply connected to her ability to bring forth beauty. We all are nourished by our sense of meaning, the thing that we are here to either offer or to support or to build, to create on behalf of others. And the first place that we want to look in terms of story as energizing, as capacity building, as resilience building, is in the territory of meaning. Just this morning, I read on um, peoplemagazine.com on my newsfeed, the story of a, a, a second grade teacher who every day does story time with her children. And she asks them if it's possible to 
you know, put their video camera on so she can see their faces and say hello to them. Hello, Caroline. Hello, Margie. Hello, Elaine. Hello, Alice. Hello, Joy, right? And just the other day, she noticed that one of her little students was very sad and was holding her head down and wasn't looking up at the camera and didn't smile the whole time. And that evening, she texted the student's mom to say, you know, I noticed your daughter was sad today. Is, can I, is there anything I can do? And the mom said, well, she's just, you know, she's having a sad day and she's, it's been a sad few days and she doesn't really know why. She just feels sad. And how many of us can relate to, right, that feeling that just comes over us of this is heavy, this is overwhelming. Well, the teacher decided that she could do something about that. And the next day she drove over to the little girl's house, brought with her some storybooks, parked at the end of the driveway, let the mom know she was there. And the little girl sat at the front of her lawn and her teacher sat at the end of the driveway and her teacher just sat on the asphalt and brought out her story bag and read her student books. So the little girl could see her in person and know that she was seen and understood and loved. I don't know what words this teacher uses to describe the sense of her meaning and purpose in life, but we can intuit that somewhere in that sense of meaning is a desire to cultivate love, to build and work from compassion, and to support learning by being kind and humane. Every single one of us has a, an array of words that we might use to elevate our own sense of meaning and purpose in life. So if you feel comfortable, I'd love to have you just write in, what are some of those words that highlight the meaning and the purpose of your lives in this moment, in this moment? Because in times of distress and times of upheaval, meaning and purpose might change, right? We might find ourselves moving in, a, in, a, in, in the direction of a new river or a new branch of our river. So if you feel comfortable, feel free to type in just some words that describe the sense of meaning in your, in your life right now. Alexandra, thank you for that nurturing of my family. Helpfulness in giving. Yes. Ah, thank you, Caroline, for typing the question. An open heart, cooking special meals, learning, expressing. My dearest, oldest friends. Gratitude. Pro providing a safe place to talk. Gorgeous showing up even when it's hard to do. Beautiful, beautiful. So in story world, we are compelled by stories that activate meaning. And the stories that we'll be most connected to, of course, are the stories that resonate with the meanings that are most significant, most potent for us. There is a second category of story, however, that also activates hope which has to do with, you know, finding delight in life. Years and years and years ago, back in the late 70s, there was a very famous comedian by the name of Irma Bombeck. Caroline, do you remember Irma Bombeck? She was hysterical and she wrote about the most ordinary things like ironing and having to prepare meals. And she, she was just brilliant at making the mundane funny. And I don't know how this happened, but the National Institute of Cancer or the American Cancer Society decided it would be wonderful if this comedian wrote a book about pediatric cancer to, to bring sort of humor and fun. And so Irma Bombeck ends up going around the country and interviewing children who are in the middle of cancer treatments and with the goal to bring some light. And one day she is sitting in the presence of a young boy, an eight-year-old boy, who has lost his hair to his treatment. And they're sitting with the social worker and the social worker is asking a very common social worky question at the time, which was, what are your three wishes? And the reason we, in counseling, we ask that question is we wanna get a sense of the, the person's um, sense of a future. Like, are they hopeful that they're going to have a future after cancer? And this little boy looked, you know, his social worker straight on and said, I want to grow up, I want to grow hair, and I want to go to Boise. 
And that became the title of Irma Bombeck's book. I want to grow up, grow hair, I want to go. We all want to get to Boise. Now, I personally have never thought about Boise as a pleasurable destination site for me. Who knows why Boise meant something to him? But what is our Boise? You know, what is it that, oh, I can't wait to get there, right? I can't wait to, to see myself there. And even in times of distress, this notion of what there, there, where there might be, you know, the place we're looking forward to, is, is tremendously compelling, tremendously compelling. I was speaking yesterday with Mo Guadat, who is, was the former head of the Google X division. The Google X division are the, is the division that creates the most out-of-the-box thinking projects, like the Google Loon Balloon, which is this um, huge balloon that floats over villages around the world that don't have internet service and brings them internet service. The Google Glasses came out of the Google X division. Driverless cars came out of the Google X division, right? So tremendous um, creativity and imagination in that team. And he left the team. He's taken a hiatus because his vision, his Boise, is he wants to, this is his company, solve for happy. He wants a billion happy people in the world. And he's going to do that one person, one moment at a time by having conversations about what lifts us even in the darkest moments. And this is a man who knows darkness and who knows joy. He, he knows the depth and he also knows his Boise. So what is your Boise? Let's take a moment now and type in, where do you want to see yourself? Let's say, let's just a year from now, where do you want to go? Do you want to go to Central Park? Do you want to go, um, I can't wait to get to Italy to see the David. I still haven't seen the David. I'm desperate to see the David. That's me. Katie, okay, oh, I need my glasses. Carrie wants to be on stage singing. Absolutely. Sedona. Sedona. Back to Columbia to hug my parents. Alexandra, yes. Where, do you, where is your Boise? Where is your Boise? Let's just get a few more. Oh, to feel my little nephew's arms tightly around me. The Nile, Elaine, I love this. Notice the particularity, right? Back to Venezuela, Italy again. The outback of Australia. Yes. Thank you. Yep, Boise, correct spelling. Live theater production with an audience, says Karen. I want to go cook for my daughter in Austin. I want to hand paint silk scarves. Prague and Vienna, Cabo San Lucas, Africa. So, 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 so beautiful. So resilient folk. I want to see 86. All right, Margie. I want to see 86. Resilient folk. We don't deny the pain or the suffering or the distress that we are in, and, and we look toward the good. And one of the ways we look toward the good is by holding a vision of what we want to move toward. Now, Bo Boise, of course, is a place. It's a destination. Many of these places, many of what you've written in are destinations, right? A mindless beach vacation with amazing food and puns and meats. Oh my God, right? We all want to go there. I want a family group hug, says Lynn. Yes, anywhere in the country with all my children and grandchildren, says Charlotte. And, and resilient folk also understand that Boise is inside, that it cannot just be located outside of us. I may never, God willing, but I may never get to Italy to see the David again. I, I may not. Who knows? Can I? Can I find Boise within? Can I find Boise within? And we are remarkable human beings. We are remarkable human beings. So we talked about stories that elevate meaning. We talked about stories that bring us toward a positive vision of the future, such as I want to get to Boise. And there are also stories that come to us through our exemplars, the, the inspiring stories of astonishing people. Now, when COVID-19 hit, there was a, a tickle in the back of my brain about a moment in history when humanity faced a similar problem and behaved beautifully. 
And I, it took me a little while to remember the story. It was written about in a book um, called The Year of Wonder, which was a fictionalized account of a true story of a village outside of Manchester, England called Iam, E-Y-A-M. And in 1666, as the bubonic plague, plague had decimated Europe, had decimated Southern England, it was on its way to Northern England. The 340 or so villagers of Iam got together under the guidance of their, their rector and made a decision. And they decided as a community, knowing that the, the plague was coming and that there was no cure, they decided to close the borders of their town so that they would harm no stranger and so that anyone who became diseased in the town would die in the company of someone they had known since they were born or someone they loved. They placed huge border stones around the village of Iam. And in the border stones, they call them the boundary stones. In the boundary stones, they carved holes and they placed coins in the holes. And then they dipped the coins in vinegar, thinking that it might keep the coins free from the plague. The Earl of the county agreed to allow them to close their borders. And tradespeople would come up to those giant border stones, which you can still see in Iam today, take the coins and leave, leave food and supplies for the people of Iam. Over the next 14 months, two thirds of the village died. But no one died alone and they infected no stranger. And because of their, what we would now call quarantine, because of their quarantine, the um, passage of the plague through Northern England began to respond because other villages began to take note and do the same. We are remarkable in our capacity for generosity, for care of others, for our awareness of how our own actions can make a positive difference in the world. More recently in 2001, after 9-11, a tiny town in Newfoundland was asked to do a remarkable thing. You see, this tiny town called Gander of only 5,000 people has a giant airport because in the 1940s and the 1950s, before we had long haul fuel jets that could go from California all the way to Europe, planes had to stop somewhere to refuel. And so for whatever reason, I don't know how, but Gandor, Gander has this giant airport. And on the afternoon of 9-11, when airspace in and out of the United States was frozen, there were planes all over the world in the air. And 36 of them were sent to Gandor, carrying 7,000 passengers, representing something like 29 languages, and an astonishing array of cultures, of dietary and religious needs and consideration. There were infants, there were elders, there were people who could not speak to anyone because they only spoke their own native tongue. And there were a couple of cats and a couple of dogs and two rare bonobo monkeys, one of whom was pregnant. And the 5,000 citizens of Gander, under the guidance of their mayor, took everyone in, housed them, clothed them, and fed them for five days and five nights, not knowing how long they would have to. Like the people of Iam, they chose generosity, love of humanity, courage, perseverance, and hope. And around the third day, the mayor invited anyone who wanted to become a native Gandarian citizen, a Newfoundlander, to come to the ice rink and drink a disgusting beer drink and kiss a cod, a fish, and sing the native Gander song, and then you became a Newfoundlander. Well, in the uh, Broadway play called Come From Away, which is the tale of this true story, in the opening song is a chorus, and in the chorus is a line. That in Gander, there's a candle in the window and the candle is always lit. You see, when we cohere as communities, just like the Nias and JCC has done, right? Every day, cohering us as a community, we are lighting the candles within us as individuals and lighting the collective candle of who we might be as our 
village, as our family, as our teams at work, as our global tribe. So looking for exemplar stories, stories of humanity at their best is the other way to cultivate hope, meaning a vision of where we want to head and look for the exemplars. So Caroline, I was wondering if you could unmute and we can maybe have a little conversation, a little questions. Absolutely. Wow. I find myself getting a little emotional about your storytelling. And, you know, it reminds me, um, can you talk a little bit about why stories in the brain are so effective, an effective way to connect us, to um, help us create meaning and, and help us manage um, times like these? So um, I love the, 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 the neurochemical piece of this. In any one moment, we are receiving something like 11 million pieces of data. A healthy mind can take in about 40 of those at any one time, but we really only focus about five, uh, on five or seven of them. So the, the brain had to find a way to take in all this information and hold it in such a way that we can actually work with it, right? We can actually sort of process it and make sense of it, make meaning of it. And story became the way that as human beings, we found to hold all of the information that's available to us. So first of all, we are hardwired for story. Secondly, story does a thing that PowerPoints and presentations and even you know writing um, like outlines and facts and data cannot do, which is story touches us at every level. In Whole Being Institute, which is your partner in this series, right? We talk about a, a model of humanity that has five elements, our spiritual, our physical, our intellectual, our relational, and our emotional. Story hits all of those. A good story hits us in our soul level, our emotions are enlivened, our intellect is intrigued, we understand our place in the world relationally, relationally relative to the story. And physically, there's a felt sense of being in the moment, right? So there are many ways in which we know story is effective. And one of the ways is that it, it, it hits us in every domain as a human being. Wow. You know, one of my, uh, somebody that I love to work with, my trainer, he's from Africa, and he says that their culture is like a talk story culture mm -hmm. and he had this parable until the tiger or until the lion knows how to write the hunter is the only story that is told the hunter's story is the only story that is told. Right. and yeah. he said you know in our culture we we talk and we tell stories by parables and that's how mm -hmm. we teach right and I thought it's so interesting that stories there's different ways in different cultures have do you have a favorite way to collect stories from around the world so, um, you know, I, I have been collecting stories since I can remember. It, it's it's one, of, one of the ways I make sense of the world. And I was the girl in my um, mom and dad's house who, whenever they let me, I would take the Reader's Digest and I would rip out the stories that I just, I couldn't get enough of. I had to read over and over and again. And um, I think I was always looking for a way to cultivate hope, which is if I were to answer my own question about the meaning of my life, it's, it's lighting hope wherever I can. And so from the time I was little, I was just fascinated by tales. And um, you know, in life, you want, you want to track what you love. You want to hunt down what you love. Like, just like I love jigsaw puzzles, I wanna give myself, permission to do jigsaw puzzles. I want, I, you know, and I give myself permission to hunt down stories. I now, through whole being, I'm in a beautiful community of learners together where we share stories. You know, often we're, people are posting stories to me and I get to post back to them. And do you find that collecting stories, but you're also a wonderful storyteller. And when did that shift happen? So, um, Evidently, my Sicilian grandfather, who I never met, who died well before I was born, Antonio uh, Vecchio, was a hell of a storyteller. And he used to hold court at the local bar and um, not go home <laughs> when he should have been home. 
and and tell tales all night long. And so rumor has it, I have some of him in me. So that's on one side. On the other side, the French Canadian side of my family, my uh, French Canadian grandmother would literally let us pile in bed with her and she would read us tales in her French Canadian accent. And so somehow just the accent made it more fascinating. And so our stories have just been embedded in me. That's amazing. It's also amazing to me that you said that stories hit every aspect of SPIRE, the ac acronym that the whole being yeah. uses. And so they really affect our whole being. And I think of the different types of stories, whether it's a drama or whether it's a, you know, even like a mystery or it's a story of hope, as you were saying. Um, I'm just wondering what type of story is, is appealing to people you know, right now that are in our audience, and maybe we can ask that, you know, what type of story is inspiring you? And then I, I wondered if you would talk also about how we can look at our own life and our own experience as a story, as a narrative, and maybe even look at this time as a way to write a story. Yes. So I'll put that in the chat, and then you can think about that. Yeah, so let's, <laughs> let's start with what stories are most helpful to you now? If you could just type in what, what you know to be true about that. Um, I, Joy, I would greatly appreciate a list of uplifting and hopeful books. So everybody, please type in what's an uplifting, hopeful book that you've read that you can share with Joy. Um, yes, Katie, that the world is that kind of story. Absolutely. The world is waking up stories of courage. Look to the moth as a story resource, stories of hope. Wisdom stories from around the world. Ah, Bobby, there's a book for you. I mean, uh, Joy. Yep. People recovering from the virus. I too, I'm, I'm fascinated by those stories, Barbara. Rising Strong is a great book from Sharon. Excellent. So notice that what lifts you in this moment is going to be different than the person next to you on the Zoom call, right? Um, some of us find it very hard right now to even read about people's experience with the virus. I'm finding the recovery stories to be absolutely gorgeous. I'm also finding the stories of the healthcare workers to be inspiring. Those are like exemplars in our life right now and how brave they are. If they can be that brave, perhaps I can be a little braver, right? That's what this, that's what story does to us also, Caroline. It, it helps us see our way through a difficult moment to a possible future. Right. Is that because it's almost like, oh, someone else has done it. It's like a model. And then our brain says, then I can do it too. Therefore, I can yep. do it too. Yes. There was a powerful story told through the moth. I'm sorry, I can't remember her name right now. Her, I know she was a, a minister in Maine and her first name is Kate. And this story became famous. So it'd be easy to look up. But the story she tells is of a family who lost a little boy to a terrible ATV accident. And um, Kate, the minister, was asked to meet the aunt and uncle um, of the little boy who had, had died because their daughter, so the cousin of the little boy, Andy, um, wanted to go see the body. And they weren't sure that it was okay to bring their little, I think she was four or five years old, daughter to go see her cousin's body. And Kate, the minister, said to the parents, I've learned to trust the human heart. And if there's any part of you that think your daughter might be okay visiting her cousin's body in the funeral parlor, I would find a way to do that. And so they think about it, they think about it, and then they, they decide to let her have her wish. And they drive to the funeral home and the daughter bolts out of the car. She cannot get to cannot get inside fast enough and she they bring her into what we the room where the bodies are which is t it tends to be a cold and very private room and her cousin Andy is laid out you know ready for his memorial service and the little girl goes up right up to her cousin absolutely fearless goes around touches all you know touches him and, and she, the whole time she's singing to him and she's talking to him and singing to him and 
and you know whispering to him and and a few times her mom who's closer to the door can hear her laugh and after about i i guess maybe i don't know 10 or 15 minutes the mom gently says to her daughter you know i it, it that's a not you know it's time to go the daughter turns around to her and basically does one of these i am not done yet and she starts singing again to her cousin andy and then as it's time for her to say goodbye, she reaches into her little pocket and pulls out a toy telescope, like a little Fisher Price plastic telescope. And she puts it in her cousin's hand and says, here, Andy Dandy, now you can look down and see us whenever you want. And then leave. What I love, there's so much to love about that story. But what I love is how the, auth the narrator of the story, Kate, holds us all with her understanding that we, she has learned to trust the human heart. The human heart, our hearts, are so capable of holding it all. We can hold worry and despair and anxiety and um, uh, terror and grief and also hold at the same time beauty and longing and love and kindness and um, astonishing tales and you know the gentle sort of waft as the robin flew by my window this morning we can hold it all we also need to learn to trust our own hearts our hearts are much bigger than we give them credit for and story helps us see that it helps us feel it and see it. If that little girl is brave enough to hold it all as she says goodbye to her cousin, we perhaps can learn to do so as well. Wow, that's a yeah. beautiful story. Powerful story. And you know, often these best stories you can't make up. You can't make up. Someone here, Donna, is writing about stories from survivors of Auschwitz, an incredible small book, just to get back to your book collect question, Joy, is called Small Miracles of the Holocaust, a beautiful collection of unbelievable tales from people who experienced Auschwitz. Um, I feed the birds every day, says Lisa, as I can't touch anyone's dog right now. And look at the meaning in that. Look at the choice Lisa has made, right? I'm, I'm going to nourish what I can, even in the presence that I am nourishing, the, the nourishing that I can't do. I can't touch a dog, it's okay. I'm going to find a way to feed the birds, right? There's meaning in there. There's vision in there. There's your authentic sense of who you might be at your best. Gorgeous. Maria, I, I'm even compelled to ask you from a Jewish lens, mm -hmm. you know, from the Jewish faith, where do stories take place in that, in that, for you, in your religion? So I, I wasn't born Jewish. I was raised as a Catholic and um, permission to those of you who love and enjoy the Catholic faith, it, for whatever reason, it just didn't sit well with me and it was probably because I was raised in a very um, ultra black and white very fundamentalist Catholic church as a young girl and it just I needed a little more flexibility in belief <laughs> and, um, and also the patriarchy of the church at my time I wanted to be a priest and that was shut down like that was not going to be an option um, so I found my way it, it, over time into Judaism where women can be rabbis and presidents of congregations and so on, but also where some of the stories um, just were incredibly compelling to me about, you know, how anyone or any people can feel or experience themselves as oppressed and find their way to freedom. I mean, that's essentially the story of the Jewish people, right, is the sense of oppression and then continuing to create and find freedom. Um, the author, Toni Morrison, once wrote, the, the, the purpose of freedom is to free someone else, right? And uh, there's so much in the value set uh, in Judaism and also in Christianity about repairing the world that um, is like that, you know, like we've been given a certain freedom and then 
take advantage of that freedom to free someone else, to, to better the, your small corner of the world, whatever that might be. So those, those were the factors that really um, lift me in terms of the story, stories of the Jewish people. And speaking of freedom, how can we use story to create a narrative right now, mm -hmm. our own narrative, that will really nourish us and help guide us through at this moment? Right. So we all have a tale that we tell ourselves that is kind of limiting, right? Uh, 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 that, is, that has a central theme that is like a central wound to us. Um, it could be, I'm not smart enough, I'm not good enough, I'll never find love again, um, uh, I can never trust. I was once working with a, a woman who said, I can't ever trust a man again because she early on in her life had been betrayed by her husband, right? So we all have stories that keep us limited and small. You guys, for, you know, 5% courage, if you wouldn't mind... Um, typing in just a li quick uh, one limiting belief that you might have. I suck as a parent. Um, um, let's see, I'm not, I'm not a good partner. Just one, just one belief, one limiting belief. Let's just get a few of them out there. I'm not doing enough, Caroline. Let's get a few more. I'm not enough, Alexandra. I must be doing something wrong. Yeah, that, that's, that's a, I'm laughing, Carrie, because that's one of mine. I can't succeed in my field, Shira. I lack self-control. Uh, hi, Yaro. I'm too lazy to exercise. Right, right. I'm concerned I won't find a partner. I'm too sensitive. I'm ruled right. by anger. Yeah, I feel too many feelings. That's the, one of the stories I was told as a little girl. I'm too lazy to clean. <laughs> I won't find love again. How will I get a job and a partner, Doreen? Yeah, the age thing kicks in. I worry too much, right? I can't see myself as successful. I can't make anything good. I'm impatient with myself. Okay, so thank you. Gorgeous, thank you. Welcome to humanity. We all have a story like this. The Dalai Lama has a story like this, right? It's just how we are. I'm not a leader, right? And so a great exercise. Notice I have a two column here. And I have a negative sign and a positive sign. A great exercise is to take the negative belief and, and write your story about it. Like, just take one example. So if my story is, I'm not a good enough mother, I'll just take one example of how I'm not a good enough mother, right? Just one example. And you write that story out. You give it permission to exist because it, it, it exists in you already. You already have a whole story about this, right? You are you're not enough of this or you're too much of that. You've already got that story. So write it down and then take a pause. And, and I mean like a real pause, like a half an hour, an hour, an afternoon, or maybe a whole day. And then write to that same theme. So if my first theme is I'm not good enough as a mother, on the, on the positive side, I want to write a story that demonstrates why I am actually good enough as a mother. So one example one moment of good enough mothering, right? I want to remind myself, and I write that story. And what you will find is the following. First of all, you're going to notice how differently you feel telling yourself one story versus the other. And they're both felt as true. When, when we're caught by our negative beliefs, we think, we think that's true. We think that's reality, right? And yet when we're writing the story that gives us evidence of the good in us. I'm not perfect as a mother, but I, I've been wonderful. I've had four, my partner and I have um, five young adult children between us. Four of them have sheltered with us for a month, plus their pets. You know, I've got a couple of examples of being good enough mother to these young adults. I'm, what I start to feel is hope, uplift, a little more energy, a little more self-love, a little more self-compassion, a little more humor about the whole thing, a little more perspective on the positive side. So first you'll notice how you feel differently. Secondly, you'll start to teach yourself, which is so important, is that there's no capital truth with a story. We can actually shape our lives by shaping our stories. And here the work of Margarita Tarragona, who does narratives in psychology, helps us remember that at any moment we can take a story that is um, 
discouraging to us and and find evidence of the other story and live toward that second story it's like going to boise that second story is like bringing yourself to boise and then we remind ourselves like carrie wrote i must be doing something right and then the best thing lisa says about writing it down is you always have a place to find it it doesn't have to be inside of you and take up all your headspace right so to, to have this simple exercise, it doesn't take long at all to help shape your own narrative. It just had to come off mute. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. I, I love that it sort of takes care of the negativity bias too. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me like it also helps us find, as you said, the humor. I know when I'm, I'm really stuck in my negative belief, when I can't seem to find, is it funny yet? Right. You know, is it funny yet? I ask myself that question. Yeah. Can, I, can I laugh at myself yet? Can I laugh at my humanity? Can I see that, you know, it's okay to be this imperfect human being and that I, I also get a do-over. I get a chance the next day. And the wonderful thing about relationships is that, you know, especially now we're, we're kind of stuck together. <laughs> <laughs> right. And here's the thing, no matter the circumstances of the moment, whether you are sheltering alone or sheltering with a bunch of people, whether you, you, you have employment or employment's been taken away from you, or whether you um, are enjoying the moment, and like some people are really enjoying this time, or whether this time is a time of tremendous fear and worry, we have control over only one thing, which is how we respond to the circumstances we find ourselves in shaping our stories in the direction of the good, reminding us of the evidence of our own capacity and strength and signature strengths and qualities of virtue within us and our own perspective and humor, etc. That is how resilient people respond. We change the story first within. I do want to go get to see the David and I may, that may never happen, but I can live the David inside. I can live the appreciation of beauty in the world right here from my window where I saw the robin fly this morning, right? That's my David today. And I can bring my attention there and savor it because it does do what Carrie just points out. It reminds us that there is something good within us. Yeah. We have a question in the chat. I think it only went to me, which is just, what if people can't recognize their virtues? And of course, we have the VIA Strengths um, organization to talk to about that, and I'll write that in as well. But I also, so you want to talk about that a little bit, about recognizing your virtues? So, so there, there are moments when we are so sort of captured by a kind of depression or overwhelm or hopelessness that it's hard for us to create our own positive story. So I just wanna acknowledge that, that that's a part of being human. There are also circumstances that are really real. I think I'm thinking now of some of those families we've read about who've lost more than one person to COVID-19, right? Um, a family in New Jersey that lost, I think a mom and a couple of, of the um, young adult, of the adult children already. and. So there are moments in life where any human being would be so depressed, sad, grief-filled, hopeless, stricken, that it would be hard to create a positive story. And that's when we wanna bring in the helpers, right? To use Fred Rogers' term from Mr. Rogers. Who are the helpers who can help us hold the stories that reflect back to us stories of light, stories of our capacity, stories of our resilience, who, who can help remind you even in the simplest ways of your own goodness. So when you are in the presence of someone who you care for, who can't find their way into that other column, then you can do that for them. You can lay out for them moments when they actually have demonstrated their value, their worth, their quality strengths, their resilience, and so on. Now, they may not be able to take it in right away, that's okay, write it down. And the reason I encourage you to write it down is so they can read it over and over again until it lands. So they can have it as, as testament and as evidence. Um, Speaking of writing things down, there's something that happens in the brain, isn't there? When we write things down, 
and that I've, uh, we had Tal Ben Shahar and he was talking about that. He said that, you know, he has a normal journal practice, but during this time he's actually doing more journaling. Mm. But can you expand on that? Why we would want to write our narratives down as well? So, I have a mixed relationship to journaling and here's why. For years, when I sat down to write in my diary, it was one sort of sad moment after another. Me too, I confess. Yeah, um, and, because, and, and be, fair enough, because I was unhappy and I was depressed for a number of years and I, was, I didn't have as much hope and I wanted to be resilient and hopeful and brave and so on, but I, I didn't know how to get there yet. And so I, permission to just acknowledge that journal writing doesn't help everyone because if all it does is reinforce negative beliefs about yourself and about the world, it's not going to help you grow. Now it helps Tal grow in part because he, he, he's big enough. He can, he has perspective and he can see his own patterns and he knows how to write to the other side, right? He knows how to integrate both the dark and the light. So I, journaling helps, um, and this is just research now, it helps us get a little distance from the story. It, it, it creates a little objective distance. Sometimes writing helps us speak the thing that we hadn't even thought yet. So it, it actually cult, it engenders wisdom, like, oh, I didn't even know I believed that, but I just wrote it, and so now I see that I do. Um, it helps us make sense of the moments that we've experienced, both the traumatic and the beneficent. And um, what I love are the journal exercises that help us hold both, right? The dark and the light. Um, because in, when we can do that, that's where wisdom grows. That's where our capacity grows. As Doreen wrote, you know, I talked about encouraging people to find the gold in every day. You can fill a journal, by the way, with the things that inspire you. They don't have to be filled with the things that went wrong that day. They actually, you can have a gold journal like gold in the world, here's my evidence, right? Within you and around you, and that's a great place to keep stories. I remember once you were talking about the story that you, were, you said to yourself about your back, right? That you had had a back injury, and then you said, but I have two other things that I combat, or I tell myself about that as well. And is that a way of sort of controlling or helping that negative dialogue and keeping you in that place of, as you referred to it, the pond versus the swamp? Yeah, so the swamp was I herniated a disc in my back. That's real. I was in excruciating pain for three weeks and then a lot of pain for over a year. And I had to change my lifestyle dramatically. And it was hard to do my work because back then I flew all the time for work and that was extremely painful. And I couldn't exercise. And exercise is my number one antidepressant. So damn, you know, like it just was terrible. Um, and, and this is what resilient people do, we build in the and. And I just every day told myself another story. I have tremendous pain and I'm so upset about this. And I know how to have fun with pain. And it's true. I have a really dark sense of humor that tends to show up when I'm in pain. And so I had, I don't have it right here right now, but I had a back pillow I call, I named him Alejandro. And it was like I was having an affair with Alejandro because he went with me everywhere. And when I lost Alejandro in London, I was so sad and I had to get a new one and I called him Jean-Paul because it wasn't the same. But now I had Jean-Paul, you know, like, so I know how to have fun with pain and I can ask for help. And so I, I became fierce about getting help because I had to, right? Um, so that and exercise is a way of getting yourself to the other side of the story. Laura is referring to a story that I, um, thank you, Laura. Um, I don't tell this story very often because I, I'm aware of how um, it, it puts me in a spotlight. And I'm also aware that as a woman, often we are afraid to spotlight ourselves. So I just wanna acknowledge the gender thing that, may, that can be happening inside of me, that it's hard to tell stories where I am the heroine as opposed to telling the story of where I'm broken and figured out a way through. I'm much more comfortable with those tales. However, in order to be an exemplar in life, in order to model for anyone, 
their own growth and resilience and capacity. It is important to honor and recognize those moments when we have really stepped up. And the story that Laura is referring to is in, 19, in um, 2011, I lost my younger brother to a very quick 10-week uh, experience of pancreatic cancer. And during the time that Johnny was living while dying, we had a beautiful energy healer by the name of Sharon come and do um, Reiki healing or energy healing on Johnny almost any day. Now, she did not live around the corner. She lived over an hour away. So whenever she came to treat my brother, she was losing her own day. She was losing her own time working on her own paying patients. And because she was a friend of my mom's, she didn't take any payment. And within a week of her showing up to take care of Johnny, we figured out two things. Number one, we would never be able to repay her. And number two, her treatments were the one thing that gave my brother peace. Which as you know, when, a love, when someone you love is in extreme pain, that's what you want for them. You want peace for them. Because of her, my brother died at the age of 48, leaving behind four teenage children and a wife and a huge community and colleagues and friends and family. He died peacefully, which we could not have imagined would have been possible. I sat with the generosity that Sharon had given my brother for months, really tortured with how can I ever repay her? I, I mean, I could have written her a check for $10,000, not that I had $10,000, but I could have written her a check for $10,000 and it wouldn't have been enough. There was no enough. Well, I came to find out that during this whole time, Sharon's daughter actually had been put in jail for drug abuse related minor crimes. And because she was in jail, her two small children had been taken away from her and that Sharon herself as the grandmother was raising her grandchildren. And I was hearing that her daughter was having a very hard time adjusting to jail and she was acting out and because she was acting out, she had been put in solitary confinement. And this is a young woman, maybe in her late twenties, early thirties. And it just felt so heartbreaking to think of a young life being so imprisoned and whatever the mindset was happening within this young woman to be imprisoned as well in a you know in an addiction cycle and it occurred to me one day if i could do one thing on behalf of sharon it might be to cultivate hope for her daughter and so i found out where her daughter was in prison and i found out how i could write to her and I wrote to her as a complete and total stranger and said that though we didn't know each other, I had known her mother for years and her mother had done a tremendous act of kindness on behalf of my brother. And out of that kindness, I wanted to offer the possibility to her daughter that strangers who she might not ever meet were sending her love through her, through her mom that she was being held in a forgiving and compassionate light in my heart and in other people's hearts, that she was young and that she was going to have another chance and that she could give herself another chance by holding fast to whatever small hope she had, that her children, that I had seen children over and over again find their way to love again, even in dark circumstances, and that her children would do so if she gave herself the chance to love herself. And that I was here for her. She could write to me or ask for my phone call or writing at any time. And that even not knowing her, I knew that she had her mom's DNA in her and therefore I believed in her and would hold fast in my belief in her. I never heard from her. I never heard whether the letter even got there. A couple of years later, she made her way out of prison. She made her way out of a halfway house and she made her way back into life where she was given custody of her children back. And she decided to open up um, a series of talks in her town on recovering from addiction. And on the evening of her first talk, of her first audience, of her first moment owning her own recovery, she talked about the darkest moment of the journey, which was being in solitary and confinement and how a letter
helped her find her way back. We never know. We never know when, who we are and what we do will create hope for someone else. This is a, a quote I wanted to leave you with today, uh, written years ago by Clarissa Pinkola Estes, an extraordinary um, Latina storyteller, one of the most powerful orators in our world. She wrote the following, we were made for these times. My friends do not lose heart. We were made for these times. I've heard from so many recently who are deeper, deeply and properly bewildered. They are concerned about the state of affairs in our world now. And ours is a time of almost daily astonishment and often righteous rage over the latest degradations of what matters most. In any dark time, there is a tendency to veer toward fainting over how much is wrong or unmended in the world. Do not focus on this. There is a tendency too to fall into being weakened by dwelling on what is outside your reach, by what cannot yet be. Do not focus there. Ours is not the task of fixing the entire world at once but of stretching out to mend the part of the world that is within our reach. Any small, calm thing that one soul can do to help another soul to assist some portion of this poor suffering world will help immensely. It is not given to us to know which acts or by whom will cause the critical mass to tip toward an enduring good. It is not given to us to know which acts or by whom will cause the critical mass to tip toward an enduring good. Any calm, small thing that one soul can do to help another soul will help immensely. This is Clarissa Pinkola Estes. So before we end, Caroline, I wanted to thank you on behalf of Whole Being Institute and the Mayerson um, community for the one calm small, which is not small at all, small thing you are doing every single day to light a part of the world that you face, right? That's all we can do is light the lights in the part of the worlds that we face, whether that's the light of our kitchen table, the light of our little neighborhood or the light of a larger community. Well, thank you. And I also just wanted to acknowledge, um, I think someone in Laura Siegel said, my mom just passed away and I have heard from many friends and relations about how her kindness impacted them when they were struggling. Beautiful. Beautiful, Laura. Yes, Laura, I'm sorry for your loss. I'm sorry. And I, I'm, I am, I am moved for you that you are hearing stories of her own generosities coming back to you. You know, it's one of my favorite parts of uh, a Jewish tradition, which is Shiva, sitting Shiva, in which we all tell stories. And this has been such an amazing time, Maria, with you to just sit and, and hear stories and tell stories. I so thank you. And you are so welcome. And just for people to know, um, that through Whole Being Institute, not only have we just opened another nine-month training certificate in positive psychology, but in May, I'm opening a, a, a class on, it's a four-part class on writing, which you can take that section, and or a four-part section on storytelling and story crafting. You can take one or both, and that's coming soon in May. Yeah, and that's, I know some of you have asked me about Whole Being Institute. Every one of our speakers is affiliated or has been a graduate of uh, the Whole Being Institute. And for some of us who are looking at this time of how can I create more meaning in my life, certainly there is, that's, that's an option to, to as well. And I encourage everyone to, to check out their webs, website, wholebeinginstitute.com, right? Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Well, and, if, and some people said they would like to save the chat. What you do to do that, everyone, is you just go to your right and there should be three little dots in the chat and you can click save the chat. Do you see where that is? And I don't know as a host if I can do that, but uh, 
Yes, you, I can. You, you can do that, yes. Okay, I yes. will save the chat and we'll see if we can send that to you with the recordings. Maria, thank you so much. This has been an amazing session, certainly meaningful for me. I feel uh, like I've had meaning, I've been elevated, and you're an exemplar. <laughs> <laughs> so let me thank put you on, all. Thank let you me all. put on thank everyone you. unmute and uh, you can say, uh, thank, thank you, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Stay, take care of yourselves. Thank you. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Maria. Love, 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 love. Love, love, love. Right uh, back so at really you. inspired. Awesome. Take care, everybody. You Bye. too. Thank, thank you. you.